everybody hear me yes. in the back? Good, thank you. Okay, well, my name is Joel Cohn. I'm legislative director for the Office of the Tenant Advocate. And welcome to this policy session entitled, What's in the Hopper Rental Housing Hot Topics at the Council? Uh, this is the first of two parts. Uh, this session will last until 3 p.m. We'll take a 15 minute break and then part two uh, will start at 3.15 p.m. So we, we hope you'll stick around for both sessions. The purpose of both of these sessions is to provide an overview of the most critical policy concerns being raised by tenant advocates at the DC Council, and also to provide an overview of what we have accomplished together. That is the advocates at this table, uh, you and the tenant community who have come out and testified at the council hearings and lobbied your council member for the enactment of tenant protection laws. Uh, working with our hardworking housing committee chaired by council member Adita Bonds and other elected officials. Uh, we have two handouts and Umar um, is going to help pass those out. Um, one of them is a list, uh, a summary of the legislation enacted in the last council period that is just now taking effect, becoming effective law this year, earlier this year. And the other one is a list of pending legislation that is legislation that has been introduced and referred to mostly the Housing Committee. Uh, these two documents are demonstrate how much has been accomplished, but also how much remains to be done. And the goal of this session is to encourage those of you who have been working hard to, to get this work done, to continue to do so, and then to bring in more advocates uh, to help with the promoting this at the council. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to also point out uh, where you can get further information uh, about the legislation on the OTA website. Uh, we have a complete tracking chart now for the previous council period and then also for the uh, progress to date in the current council period. We also have uh, brochures, frequently asked questions on uh, the new late fee law and other uh, recently acted legislation. Um, let's see, two other handouts. We have speaker bios, which have been somewhat updated. Uh, so please look at those. Uh, we're going to keep uh, introductions very brief, but we have a stellar expert uh, panel here. We hope that you'll, you'll look at their, their resumes. Uh, then also we have surveys, which we ask you to complete before you leave uh, and give to Umar or Carlene. And Umar, Raise your hand again, please. And Umar can, we're gonna, thanks. Is Carlene here? And Carlene's not here yet. Okay, so with that, I'm going to um, s uh, say who the panelists are, and then I think we'll dive into the presentations in, in order. So first up is going to be Barry Weiss, who's legislative director for at-large council member Anita Bonds, uh, Jennifer Berger, a supervisory legal aid attorney for AARP Legal Counsel for the Elderly, uh, Beth Harrison, supervising attorney for Legal Aid Society for the District of Columbia, Scott Bruton, uh, who is the vice president of housing policy for the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development, and then Rob Wall who's a tenant organizer with the Latino Economic Development Center. And so with that, um, let me just say a word about format. The panelists will, uh, since we're starting a little bit late, we'll tr try to keep the panelists' presentations to about seven minutes each. Uh, we'll provide a little bit of time for follow-up uh, amongst the panelists, and then we'll save at least a, a minimum of 30 minutes for audience uh, Q&A. Uh, so Barry, take it away. Are you gonna help us out with uh, like a five minute Heads up. Yes. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Barry Weiss, and I'm going to talk about uh, a few pieces of legislation that the council has worked on. But before I go there, I'd like to talk a little bit about why we have to be so busy writing legislation about rent control. I mean, it's the law. Why should there be any kind of a problem? Well, there are lots of problems. The rent control law in D.C. is one of the most protective and expansive rent control laws in the country, but a lot of people simply don't know what their rights under rent control. I lived in a rent control building for, for probably 15 years before I had any idea that D.C. even had rent control. 
or that my uh, building built originally in uh, 1909 would be under rent control and what that meant or any of that kind of stuff. So that's part of the problem is a lot of the tenants really aren't aware that there are laws that are protecting them. But the, the bigger problem is the extensiveness of the rent control law and the fact that uh, a lot of housing providers, certainly not every last housing provider, but a lot of them feel very strongly that rent control is harming the District of Columbia, is harming their bottom line, that tenants everywhere would be better off if we got rid of rent control, and that we would allow more housing providers would be interested in building housing because there would be more supply. Uh, then that the price of housing would go down, then a kind of a Ronald Reagan trickle-down effect. That's a philosophy, and, and, and we, uh, we give it, it the respect that it's due. But the problem is not so much their philosophy, is that these housing providers hire some very talented, very experienced, very competent attorneys to try to poke holes in the rent control law that would allow them to effectively negate the effects of rent control. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of times they are very successful. And the current uh, committee and the, the folks here that I work with, we are working very hard so that when we write legislation going forward, they will be bulletproof, that you can't drive any of the trucks through it to negate the purposes of rent control. We believe that rent control is absolutely essential for uh, the diversity of Washington, D.C., for the economic, cultural, uh, sociological diversity of the city. Without rent control, we wouldn't have that. So essentially, uh, what we have is a, a back and forth between those of us who write laws and advocate for laws to protect tenants and protect affordability and, and uh, others in the city who want very much to, to negate rent control and find ways to get around it. And as one of the bills I'll discuss later on, uh, they have been in some respects so successful that uh, in some instances we have buildings that are under rent control and that ha actually have uh, available prices that are legal under rent control that are way above what the market could bear. And we're fighting to get those rents at least down to market. Ideally, rent control ought to be below market. I did some research on uh, New York City, which has rent stabilization. And uh, my understanding of the research there that all of the things being equal, a rent control, a rent stabilized apartment is about 15% less expensive than a comparable, build, comparable building next door that is not under rent stabilization. That ought to be at least our goal in Washington, D.C. Not that for get rent control apartments down to market level, but get rent control apartments less than 15%. So that's the background of why we are so busy and why we have to write laws that are plugging holes in laws that we've inherited from, from the past on rent control. And we're also writing laws for, for the future. So one of the laws that uh, I want to mention is not actually under rent control. It's actually TOPA. And some of you may have heard about the Museum Square case. And as I hope you all know by now, that whenever a building goes on sale, whether or not they have somebody who wants to buy it or the, the housing provider just intends to sell the building, they have to offer the building to the tenants. That's great, but only if they offer the building to the tenants at a price that, that with some help from the city, with some help from other subsidies, that the tenants could actually afford. Well, uh, there's actually a very, very valuable building in downtown Washington in an area that used to be not so nice, but is now is getting really stylish, called Museum Square. And the building is uh, mostly inhabited by elderly African Americans and Asians, Asian Americans living there. They're all seniors. And when the building, got, the tenants got offered the building, they got offered the building at a price not what it's currently worth, but what the building might be worth in the future, which of course is a price that nobody could possibly afford. It'll be difficult enough for the tenants to afford the building under the current price. So we wrote a law that clarified a gap in the TOPA law that didn't make it clear that when you offer to the tenants, you have to offer it on a bona fide price based on the value of the building today and not the value of the building once it got developed. 
and this essentially has saved all the tenants of that building. It gives them hopefully the opportunity with some subsidies from uh, the National Trust uh, for Housing and from the city, they might be able, their, the chances of them being able to stay in their homes are significantly greater. In addition to the legislation that we wrote, which will apply to the future, uh, the Court of Appeals has also agreed with the tenant. So this is one of the bills that we passed. It's called the Total Bonafide <laughs> Offer of Sale Clarification Amendment Act of 2015. That's one of the council's successes, and I had the help of all these uh, folks on the panel here to help us write that. Another bill that we have successfully passed is called the Rent Control Hardship Petition Limitation Amendment Act. I know these bills have very long names. Uh, that's not, not because we get paid by the, the number of words, but it's an, it, we have to describe the, the bill. You know, this is a hardship petition limitation. We have a gazillion rent control bills. This bill, under current D.C. law, if a housing provider isn't taking in enough money according to their calculations to pay their bills, they can claim hardship and petition the rent administrator to increase rent. If the rent administrator doesn't decide within 90 days the request, they can, up until this law, they can automatically get that increase. And the increase in rent could be anywhere from $50 a month to several hundred dollars a month. And what that effectively meant, without any adjudication of the request at all by the government or any independent body, they got what they asked for. And a lot of them would just ask for the moon knowing that the people there couldn't pay it, drive everybody out, and then they won't have to deal with any tenants. So what this bill said that if they make this request and the rent administrator doesn't make a decision within 90 days, and that almost never happens anyway, only if they're not making a certain amount of profit, which was very little, could at, under those circumstances, could they get a 5% rent increase, which is for a lot of people it may be tough, but certainly a 5% rent increase is much better than a 30% or a 60% or a 100% rent increase. So this also helped tenants stay in their homes until the rent administrator decided, made a decision on, the, on these requests. And in most of those requests where they actually go to the bitter end, they're not granted anyway. So this helped protect tenants. Uh, another bill that, how much time do I have? Last bill. Last bill. Uh, I can get two bills done in, in one minute. One bill that we, we're working on is to increase what's called the rental unit fee. Every housing provider pays a tax on every unit that they, uh, that they rent. We're trying, that hasn't been increased since 2008. I did the calculation of CPI plus 2% on that amount. We're trying to increase it all the way up to from 2150, which it was then, to $30, which will help us fund the, an elderly bill with council member bonds uh, passed last session, which Jen is going to talk about. Any seconds left? If you're going to mention the database. Uh, the database <laughs> is another bill that we passed, which will make everybody's lives better, uh, including the housing providers and the tenants and the social mm -hmm. researchers. It'll be requirement that Every single that happens under rent control has to be done through this wonderful database, which will control if somebody tries to raise your rent and, and they're trying to raise it by 4%, but the law only allows 1.28%, it'll reject it. If you want to do a hardship petition, it'll have to be done. Through, everything will be done through the database. Everybody will be able to look up what their rent uh, can be, what the law will allow. It will collect all this information, and it's going to solve every problem in the world. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jen Berger, and I supervise the eviction prevention team at ARP Legal Counsel for the Elderly. I first of all wanted to thank Barry for being such a great and supportive ear for all of our random ideas that then turned into laws, and we really appreciate your time. So I wanted to talk about a couple of bills. Um, the first one, elder, the Elderly and Tenants with Disabilities Protection Amendment Act of 2015 addresses the lack of affordability of private housing for people who are, have disabilities or 62 and over, and enhances the rights of those individuals. First of all, the law prohibits rent increases 
where the housing provider has not given information to the tenant about the ability to file an elderly disability status application under rent control. A lot of tenants don't know. As much as we do, as, as much outreach as we can, there are people who are not able to leave their homes that, that don't know about their rights, and housing providers need to more affirmatively inform those tenants of their rights. And separately, we saw time and again that tenants would come into us with their social security incomes being outpaced by their rent because Rent was capped at maximum 5%, um, but also the um, consumer price index, which was often higher than the Social Security cost of living allowance. So this bill added Social Security cost of living allowance to one of the choices as to the um, rent increase that a tenant could experience in, under rent control. And it would be the lower of the consumer price index, the Social Security cost of living allowance, or 5%. And, it's really important to know that under this bill, housing providers who fail to comply with the bill we can be penalized. And that is important teeth that we didn't have before. So if you think your rights were violated under, under these bills, come to one of our offices to get help. And this has been a dream come true for me after, after 11, and you think I'm kidding, I'm not. I live this stuff. So after 11 years of being at Legal Counsel for the Elderly and time and again litigating um, the capital improvement petitions and substantial rehab petitions and hardship petitions and seeing the capital improvement petitions which were the least impactful petition, which is where the increase would be um, maximum 20% relating to improvements in the building. Um, that, there was an exemption for capital improvement petitions for people with disabilities um, or people who were seniors, but not for the more impactful petitions, hardship petitions and substantial rehab petitions. So I'm happy to say that this bill and if somebody's income is 60% of AMI, area median income or less, which just to give you an idea uh, for a household of one, that would be 45,600, household of two, 52,128. Um, so if you f fall into that category of having a disability, being a senior 62 or over, or and having that income of 60% of area median income, then you're protected from these housing provider petitions that would increase rent drastically above rent control levels, and therefore your apartment can remain affordable. Again, it's really important that people know about this. So you are ambassadors. I see a lot of you are people who have been to OTA summits before, and I know share the wealth of the knowledge you're gaining. It's really important to spread the word of what you're hearing today. And then, um, that rent administrator can affirmatively deny the, um, the, the, rent, the elderly disability status only if there's clear and convincing evidence of error, fraud, or falsification. In other words, they have to generally um, approve of the elder disability status application. And then there's a tax credit associated with the exemption to housing for elders and people with disabilities for the housing provider petitions. Um, so housing providers can, can get a tax credit up to a total of $1.25 million annual tax credit combined for housing providers. So that, that will incentivize complying with the law. But if housing providers do not, then they can be penalized. So keep that in mind. And then the second bill, um, Residential Lease Clarification Amendment Act of 2016 is a partial dream come true. Uh, there were times where I was constantly on the phone with housing providers, especially those not represented by counsel, and saying, no, it's not convenient for you to send a worker who my client doesn't know at night when they're always discouraged from answering the door at night if they don't know who the person is. So this bill clarifies when a housing provider can have somebody come to the unit or, or themselves access the unit, normal business hours, um, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and with 48 hours written notice. Now, email or text is fine if the tenant writes back. I'm fine with that and I want the repair done sooner. Um, emergencies may be an exception, but that's only, again, for, for extreme emergencies. Um, a housing provider also has a duty to what's called mitigate damages. If a tenant moves out earlier than the lease provides, for a variety of different reasons that may happen. Medical emergencies is, is one reason. Then the housing provider can't just sit for the rest of the lease period, like five months, and do nothing, and then sue the tenant for damages for that time period. They need to show that they've tried to re-rent the property. And in this restrictive affordable housing market, that should not be a problem. Um, then the, uh, the act also provides that the, the landlord cannot unreasonably deny the tenant's request to sublet 
if the lease doesn't say anything about subletting or permits subletting. And the housing provider can be penalized. Again, there's a penalty clause for bad faith in including prohibited lease provisions. Examples of prohibitive le prohibited lease provisions are waivers of notices if a tenant breached the lease or um, requiring the tenant to make repairs or waiving a right to a rent credit if the tenant experiences repair issues or excessive late fees. Any of those provisions in lease and many more are illegal and the housing provider can be, can be penalized for that. And ordinary wear and tear. So if you're wondering why sitting in these um, policy meetings is so important, about a year ago or two years ago, I was here at one of these meetings and I talked about a dream item, which is that wear and tear items should not be count, uh, should, first of all, should be repaired. Like that, and we're still working on that. That's going to take a lot of work with Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. However, a small victory is that a tenant's security deposit cannot be withheld for normal wear and tear items. So if a tenant used the property or used the appliance in a normal way, for instance, and it happens to be older and more worn, the tenant is going, not going to be charged for that. We see a decent amount of security deposit cases, and, and this will help tremendously in, in uh, addressing those cases because housing providers often withhold security deposits. And lastly, um, and which is one step closer to another dream, but the dream has not come true yet, and I'll be fighting for this dream, um, is that the Office of Attorney General under the At-Risk Tenant Protection Clarification Emergency Temporary Amendment Act of 2016. Say that two more times fast. <laughs> I'll say it backwards and anyway. Um, they will be able to apply the Consumer Protection Procedures Act, which has trouble damages with it, to landlord-tenant relationships. Now, it is my dream that tenants as individuals would be able to do that too. And I haven't given hope on that. I think that's going to happen. And I believe it will be the next step. It's, um, it's in judiciary. It's not in our committee. So it will happen in a different way than in your committee. <laughs> it will happen though. Um, for instance, issues like baiting and switching, saying that the tenant's gonna get one apartment of a certain square feet and then changing up what that apartment was. It used to also be late fees, but late Beth fees. will talk about late fees further. And I don't, want with, I don't wanna keep that from happening. So I'm gonna turn it over to Beth <laughs> to talk about her piece. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Beth Harrison. I'm a supervising attorney at Legal Aid. I'm trying not to have my voice be too loud. Um, and one of the things I do is supervise our eviction practice. And so we have a project with Bread for the City where we're down in landlord tenant court every single day of the week with attorneys to help. And um, as part of that practice, we're obviously helping individuals in their eviction cases, but we're always looking for things that are problems. You know, those things that you see over and over again that landlords are doing that are not fair. And late fees certainly was one of those issues. Um, and as Jen said, we don't have a consumer protection law that we can use because some of the things that landlords do are really unfair. They're the kinds of things that if a business did it to you, you could sue them under this consumer protection law. And so there was an opportunity with one of these um, other bills that was introduced in the council to bring up this issue and say, we should do something about late fees. So some of the problems we would see, we would see late fees that are just too high. They're just kind of unfair that they are so high compared to the rent that wasn't paid. Um, we would see tenants with subsidies where they're only paying part of the rent and the subsidy is paying a large part of the rent, but the late fee was based on the entire rent. And so you could have somebody whose rent might be $100 a month and they would be charged a $25 or $50 late fee. That seemed really unfair. And then the other thing we saw is that landlords, if you paid your rent late, in a particular month and you didn't pay the late fee, the next month the landlord would say, well, you're behind because you didn't pay the late fee. And you would turn in your rent check, even if you turned it in on time for the entire rent, and the landlord would say, no, 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 you haven't paid the rent for this month because I'm gonna subtract out the late fee and now you're short, and guess what? I'm gonna charge you another late fee. And so you might be late one month and you would rack up you know, 10, 15 late fees. And you would look at some of these bills that tenants were getting and realize most of what they owe is actually late fees. You know, Maybe they were, they were late once or they were late twice, but a lot of what the landlord's really trying to get is just the late fees. And so all of those problems we brought, and I wanna echo um, Jen's thanks to Barry and other staff for Council Member Bonds and Council Member Bonds herself, because this was an issue we just brought brought it up at a hearing and her staff was willing to talk to us about actually turning this into a law. And so the law was passed as of December of last year. Um, the kind of big picture things that the law does, number one, it puts a cap on late fees of 5%. 
and it's 5% of whatever your share of the rent is as a tenant. So if you get a subsidy, you only have to pay 5% of what you pay each month, not the entire rent amount. The law also made clear if you get a subsidy and it's the subsidy provider who doesn't pay. So let's say the housing authority is supposed to be paying rent each month on your unit and they just don't send the check. Well, that's not the tenant's fault. And so you cannot, as a tenant, be charged a late fee if that's what's going on. And then the whole practice of the landlords kind of stacking late fees on top of each other has also been ended by the law. And then finally, the law says that no tenant can be evicted for not paying a late fee. So what does that mean? Um, and uh, the Superior Court, the Landlord Tenant Branch, has been looking at this and making changes. And so tenants who are down in court now, if they're sued for non-payment of rent, um, all tenants have the right to pay up everything that they owe in that kind of case up until the moment the marshals come. And that total amount that you're required to avoid eviction, it used to be that whatever late fees were due could be included in it. Now landlords can't include those late fees. So as long as you catch up on all of your rent, even if you still owe late fees, you will not be evicted. Um, and there are a lot of other changes that are gonna happen down there. I'm, I, one of the things I do is sit on the Landlord Tenant Rules Committee, and so there are a lot of forms that are being changed and things that are being done to make sure that um, late fees cannot be charged when they shouldn't be. Um, tenants are still gonna be able to agree to pay the late fees with their landlord if they want to. Some tenants would rather just pay off that money and have, be free and clear. But those kinds of agreements will get some extra scrutiny from the judges. And um, so there are a lot more protections for tenants. And that really is a real problem that was fixed. How am I doing on time, Joel? Because I can mention one other thing or I can let, I can move on. One minute and no strings attached. All right, I'll just <laughs> let Scott go. Hi, everybody. My name is Scott Bruton. I'm Vice President uh, for Housing Policy at the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development. Instead of uh, talking to you about legislation that's been passed or is pending, I'm going to talk to you about issues with the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. How many of you are already familiar with the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act? Okay, decent amount. How many of you have been through the TOPA process, have actually been in a building that went through it? Okay, smaller number. So I'll go do a, a brief overview. The Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, as passed in 1980 and revised hardly ever, uh, thankfully, since then, um, gives tenants in single family on up through buildings that have several hundred units uh, the right to purchase or assign their right to purchase when their building goes up for sale. Uh, this has been a, a really important right. Uh, at, since 1980 for uh, tenants in the district to either uh, through conversion to a cooperative or a condominium to uh, go from uh, paying rent to being an owner, or if they decide that they want to continue uh, renting, uh, uh, it, being at a rental property, to assign the right to purchase to uh, a developer or landlord of their choice, uh, and in exchange for that right to negotiate the terms under which that building would be run and what uh, extra benefits they might have for assigning that right. Uh, because TOPA is a very unique law, there are very few other jurisdictions in the country that have a first right of refusal law. Um, and because it gives tenants more power in, in the disposition and the running of the rental property in which, they've resi in which they reside, um, there is a cottage industry among uh, developer, certain developers and lawyers to try to find innovative ways, loopholes, gray areas in the law, uh, to try to uh, shift that balance of power in ways that are more advantageous to either their clients or themselves as p potential purchasing developers. And so what I'm going to talk about today um, are relatively new, say over the past few years, uh, in some cases several years, ways that lawyers and developers have found to try to get around things. And I am going to be telling you all about this because since you are here, you are most likely tenant advocates or community advocates or representatives of your community. And I'm hoping that you'll share this knowledge with members of your community or friends, uh, neighbors that you know uh, are going through the TOPA process. Uh, the first of these, is that some assert, 
one particular real estate broker has been the pioneer in this one at a particular uh, real estate brokerage, and that is to, these real estate brokers represent the seller uh, of a building, and it, they also um, are involved with who the third, car, the, the third party purchaser is, the, the entity that wants to purchase the building at the beginning of the TOPA process. Um, the District of Columbia, through the Department of Housing and Community Development, provides funding to community-based organizations such as the Latino Economic Development Center, which Rob works for, and Housing Counseling Services, to provide technical assistance to tenants going through the TOPA process, because it is very complicated. They help them understand the law, how to register for their rights, how to find an attorney to represent them, things like that. DHCD gives uh, information to these CBOs to let them know buildings come up as TOPA buildings so that the CBOs can get out there and help tenants so that they can make an informed decision about what they want to do. This particular real estate broker has decided to get out ahead of that process and because they know when the contract's going to be signed and when the TOPA notice is going to go out to the tenants, they, these, this real estate broker goes out and since TOPA is an arcane law and, and quite complicated, will offer his services to help tenants understand TOPA and then to assign their rights for far less um, than they could negotiate for, either monetary compensation or uh, how the building is going to be run, rent concessions, things like that, then tenants would be able to get if they were being helped by reputable uh, community-based organizations or lawyers. Um, by doing so, getting the tenants to assign their rights within a day or two of the TOPA notice going to these tenants, they have effectively gotten the tenants to give up, well, to, give, to sell their, or to assign away their TOPA rights for a fraction of the, the concessions that they could have gotten from uh, developers competing for their rights or from even considering the possibility of converting to a condominium or a cooperative uh, to become owners of their property. Um, the second, and I'm, in the question and answer period, I can, I'm happy to go over these uh, in more detail. The second are developers uh, themselves, those who are interested in buying the property, the third party contract purchaser, or even sometimes the seller, uh, helping to pre-organize tenants and offering payments to the tenants in order for them to decide not to exercise their TOPA rights. In single family buildings, tenants have individual TOPA rights. In two to four unit buildings, tenants can have individual rights. In five plus unit buildings, the majority uh, that where tenants exercise their rights, tenants have no individual TOPA rights. They only have them collectively as a tenant association that registers for their rights and collectively as a nonprofit association decides what to do with them. Tenants, though, don't know this. And so a, a developer will come and offer them, say, $500 if you don't do anything to exercise your TOPA rights, if you don't form an association, if you don't do anything about this. And tenants, not knowing uh, the value of their TOPA rights and what can be done with this, will often think, oh, I guess they're giving me a good deal by offering me some money, and I didn't know that I was going to do this anyway. The tenants then feel that because they've signed a piece of paper and perhaps have even accepted some money um, in consideration for this, that they therefore then have no TOPA rights. And you, so then even if a community-based organization goes out and tries to help them understand, they feel that they've lost out on their rights and they're scared of the possible legal ramifications of going against the paper, which is really legally meaningless, and the payment they received, which is based on a legally meaningless document. And so it makes it a much harder barrier to cross to get tenants in those buildings to exercise their rights. So that makes this very problematic. The third are where uh, there's one particular lawyer who works for a major law firm uh, who at the first building they did this at was Capitol Park Towers and it's since been done at about five or six other buildings where uh, a lawyer who has corporate legal experience will be paid by a developer trying to gain the rights to purchase the building um, 
sometimes they're the third party purchasers, sometimes they're uh, kind of an invasive uh, developer coming in. Um, and what they will do is they and this particular lawyer will find a tenant who has joined the Tenants Association or maybe two or three that they can, it's been suggested, offer some kind of consideration to, to file a lawsuit against the Tenants Association saying that the Tenants Association violated their bylaws or their, their corporate rule structure in some way and therefore because basically it's holding tenants associations to the same type of corporate governance laws that you would hold a major corporation to. And the, the TOPA uh, law was written in a way to recognize that tenants associations are moving on a deadline, are not really, uh, you know, uh, well versed in uh, corporate, uh, in, in how corporations work and are working with community-based organizations to try to do this as best as they can uh, by the law. But it's holding tenants association to a different legal standard than they have been for a long time. This type of lawsuit, if the tenants association is, rep is represented by a knowledgeable attorney, will lose. But it will take two, three, four, five or more years to get through the process, but to get through the courts. Um, the difficulty is that the tenants, when exercising their rights, their TOPA deadline is going to run out. Or the developer that they've decided to assign their rights to, or those helping them wanting to convert to a co-op or a condominium, will be loath to take on the financial responsibilities involved in a several year in winning a several year long lawsuit and so even if you will not even if this this attorney and these few co-opted tenants will not win the lawsuit in the end they will effectively win because the tenants desires and goals in the topa process will have been thwarted uh, by the filing of this lawsuit and having to go through this process. I'm guessing I'm over time. I have one more I can talk about if you'd like, but I'm willing to go on to Rob. I think we're okay if you want to do one more, but do one more. Okay. The other one is specific to single family TOPA issues. Um, if you read, um, oh gosh, Urban Turf, or I think it was Channel 5 had a news story about a particular tenant in a single family home. Uh, they, were, they were renting the basement apartment and they were gaming the TOPA system uh, according to, uh, according to the, the news um, and extorting money uh, by messing with the TOPA process. They were being aided and abetted um, in this, you know, like a crime dramas and stuff, aided and abetted in this by one particular lawyer who I will not mention because I don't want to give him business, who has, this, who has determined to make a market out of the assignability of TOPA rights for single family buildings. And he goes trolling around door to door, knocking on people's doors who have gotten TOPA rights and telling them that he can make them a lot of money if he'll let them negotiate the deal for him. Now, this is not necessarily a flaw in the TOPA process. This is as with many um, laws that are out there, there are lawyers who will always try to find an angle to, in order to make some money off someone else's transaction. And that's what's going on with this. And it's a matter of tenants knowing their rights and you know being a bit ethical in things, but also landlords and um, real estate agents knowing what they're doing when they get involved with renting um, a unit in a single family property. And for the return that you get, you have to comply with the laws of which TOPA is one. And so this is a complex issue which is being negotiated now uh, between various different uh, groups trying to find some solution which will end the market created by this one particular lawyer with doing minimal um, harm to the, the long-standing and important TOPA rights of uh, tenants and single-family properties. Thank you very much. All right, thank you all. Um, my name is Rob Wool. I'm a tenant organizer at Latino Economic Development Center. Uh, hopefully I don't have to go too into depth about what we do since Scott so kindly introduced us, but we are 
one of the community-based organizations that he referred to, we've got a team of five tenant organizers. We go out to groups of tenants throughout the city, either when they're in the TOPA process or when they're facing a uh, building-wide rent increase or when they have conditions issues and try to uh, help the tenants get organized, form a tenant association, come up with a strategy and execute that strategy to keep their housing affordable and uh, livable. Um, and so I want to close by talking about some of the systemic threats to affordable housing that exist throughout the city, um, specifically focusing on how we're losing rent-controlled housing. Um, a lot of people have probably heard the statistic about how between 2001 and 2012, was it, the city lost about half of its low-cost housing. Um, we've lost tens of thousands of cheap rental units. Um, and those are disappearing in a variety of different ways. Uh, there are condo conversions. There's out-and-out -out demolition of dilapidated property. Um, there are, you know, single-family homes and just non-rent-controlled properties, their rents rise and they are no longer affordable. But one large area where D.C. is losing affordable housing is uh, the wearing away of the stock of rent-controlled housing. As Barry was saying, rent control is supposed to preserve uh, a supply of below-market rate housing. That's what we, that's the purpose of having the law in large part. Um, and it is somewhat effective in doing that, but there are a lot of creative strategies that some unscrupulous landlords in the district have found to start removing rent control protection from big chunks of housing all at once. And so I'd like to just focus a little bit on uh, how that's happening and how, we, how, the, how the council has begun to address that and some of the, the issues that have not been addressed as of yet. So. Um, Barry, in his talk, alluded a little bit to the issue of housing provider petitions, landlord petitions. Are people familiar with these? Uh, that's a question. I don't know. Um, landlord petitions are what they sound like, a petition that a landlord can file with the city uh, requesting the right to do a rent increase that's higher than what rent control can usually allow. Um, there are a number of circumstances in which you can ask for a petition. Uh, if you want to do capital improvements, if you want to add a new elevator, for instance, you can do a petition for that to try to get the, the, the tenants to pay for it. Um, to do a substantial rehabilitation, uh, which is somewhat different from a capital improvement, but defined in the law, you can request a petition and potentially get a big rent increase. Um, and then there are hardship petitions. If a landlord is not making theoretically enough money to remain in business to pay their bills, they should also be able to get an emergency rent increase so they're not driven in, in, out of business. That was a concern, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago when D.C. really was experiencing significant disinvestment from its housing stock, um, less so today. But, and and the, the, so there are these legal mechanisms where landlords can file to get rent increases that are much higher than the usual inflation plus 2% increase, they can go to 30%, 50%, in some cases 100% rent increases. Um, and then there are also, there's a mechanism known as voluntary agreements, which often work in conjunction with, uh, with these petitions where tenants, um, tenants and landlords, if 70% of tenants sign an agreement uh, with the landlord, they can take a rent increase above uh, the usual rent control limit. Um, the, I, when, when the voluntary agreement mechanism was created, the situation that was contemplated by, was that landlords might, or landlords and tenants might come to an accord about having some kind of improvements to a property that the tenants would be willing to fund. Uh, you know, if they want to add balconies to the apartments, they want to upgrade the gym, then tenants could voluntarily agree to pay more for that. But that is not really how voluntary agreements are typically used now. Typically, voluntary agreements, uh, the ones that are signed today, effectively just completely decontrol the rents of tenants while protect, well, they decontrol the rents on these apartments in the future while protecting the people who are currently in the buildings. So tenants are bargaining away the uh, future affordability of the housing they're living in. Um, and that is, they're not, these are called voluntary agreements. They are less voluntary than they really ought to be. And so I'd like to talk about some particular buildings where I've worked and why, how 
these different mechanisms uh, work together to, um, to really take away a lot of affordable housing. So there's one really great example, I think, uh, of a building on Nicholson Street Northwest. It's a couple blocks from the new Walmart. It's in a, uh, an area of DC that's about to experience really significant gentrification around like the Brightwood neighborhood, very close to Walter Reed. Um, it's, so that, that was a, a, it's like a 30 unit apartment building. It was rent controlled when, before the business I'm about to describe happened, rents were in the universe of uh, like 600 to thousand dollars, depending on when people had moved in and uh, apartment size. And a lot of people had been there for 40 some odd years. There are very old, long time tenants there. Um, the, so the, the, the landlord at that property filed a hardship petition uh, saying that he wasn't making 12% rate of return. That is the, that's the profit rate that a landlord is entitled to, 12%, which is higher than Walmart's profits, higher than Google's profits. It's like it's sort of, it's a, it's a legacy of uh, the 70s and high inflation rates. Um, but it's, it's enshrined in law that landlords are entitled to a 12% rate of return on uh, rent controlled property. So this guy wasn't making that. He filed the petition. He was granted a conditional increase. These were the things that Barry was referring to. So a few years ago, uh, if you filed for a conditional increase, if you filed for a hardship, you could get a conditional increase without there being any hearing or oversight or opportunity for the tenants to challenge um, what, the, what the increase had been. So, these tenants got a, they, the, the tenants received notice that their rent was being raised under this conditional increase by about 70%. Um, people's rents were going from like $500 to $800 or from $800 to $1,200. Um, not wanting to be displaced, people started paying that increase and preparing a legal challenge. Um, eventually, an administrative law judge ruled that that increase had been much too high uh, told the tenants to stop paying the increase uh, it, and ordered the landlord to reimburse the money to the tenants. He didn't do that. Um, he didn't reimburse the money. He refused. Uh, the, again, the tenants took him to court, but having paid thousands of dollars in rent that they were owed back, and these are not wealthy people. They, you know, if they had paid, overpaid $5,000, $10,000 in rent, that was a significant economic burden on them. Um, so they were in court for years trying to fight this out. And eventually, after some protest activity and after some council members, including council member Bonds, got involved putting pressure on the landlord, uh, the landlord came back and offered a settlement agreement that included a voluntary agreement that would raise, that would return tenants to the rents they had been paying before all the petitions were put into place, but for tenants who had not been there before the petition and for all future tenants, rents would go up to effectively market rate. So the landlord was able to use a hardship petition to pressure, to you know, force tenants to pay this huge increase, and then they were under significant economic pressure, and so were willing to make concessions they would not otherwise make uh, in order to ha be protected themselves. Um, now, the, the emergency and now finally permanent legislation that reformed the conditional increases has made it much harder for landlords to sort of push tenants into accepting a voluntary agreement through that particular mechanism. Um, and as a result, I think in, in general, we're seeing fewer hardship petitions these days because landlords were not using them because of an economic burden. They were using them as a bludgeon to put as much economic pressure as they possibly could on low-income tenants to try to either force them to leave without putting up a fight or to make concessionary agreements uh, to raise rents to market rate. That's not happening as much anymore, but landlords have other tools at their disposal. They can, you know, if tenants who are living in bad conditions uh, for long periods of time might be more willing to make an agreement if they believe that that, is, um, that will allow the landlord to improve the quality of life in a property. Um, and then there are just, there's various forms of, you know, harassment, neglect, um, and bullying and threats of eviction or rent increases or bankruptcy or a building sale or whatever that landlords can still use to push for voluntary agreements that, uh, that decontrol that housing. And these voluntary agreements are, have been used by some smart developers to just convert a lot of DC's stock of low cost housing to luxury rental. Uh, that's happened a tremendous amount in like Adams Morgan, Mount Pleasant, Columbia Heights. A lot of the uh, historically affordable housing there is now 
high end because these voluntary agreements uh, did that. And that adds a tremendous amount of value to the property of that landlord. So it's, it's, it's big business and it, that, that's, a, that's a powerful lobby. Um, luckily, uh, Council Member Bonds has shown some interest in taking them on. We're excited about the voluntary agreement reform legislation that was introduced um, earlier this year that would reform voluntary agreements in a way that makes it a little tougher to do these agreements that totally decontrol future rents uh, and that offer that offer these, I mean, Barry knows a lot more about it and can describe it more, but uh, it, it would just change voluntary agreements so that you couldn't have as radically different sets of terms for current and future tenants. Tenants wouldn't be in a position of bargaining away um, the rights of the people who are going to move into the apartments after them. Great. So that is something we're hopeful about and probably can be discussed more later on. Definitely. Excellent. So thank you very much. And I think that was a wonderful overview both of what's been accomplished and the amount of the work that needs to be done because there's still a lot of problems out there with rental housing and the strong laws that need to be made stronger and protected. I want to acknowledge a couple people. First and foremost, former mayor and current council member, Ward 7 council member, Vincent Gray has stepped into the room. We're delighted. <laughs> To, to have him right here, and it's, it's most appropriate because as mayor and now as council member, uh, Vincent Gray has been a, a true champion of the OTA legislative agenda, a champion of all of the causes that our advocates are talking about, and it's, it's a pleasure to have you here, so thanks so much. Okay. Rarely missed uh, the uh, annual uh, pilgrimage to uh, OTA. <laughs> well, welcome back. Welcome back. And uh, I also want to acknowledge Commissioner Diana Epps of the Rental Housing Commission. And uh, Dan Mayer, I have to acknowledge as well. He's, our, he's the, the legal clerk for, uh, for the commission and does some very great work with the OTA as well. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge, by way of segue, uh, two council staffers who are here. One is uh, Kelly Hunt, who is the legislative counsel. Uh, for Alyssa Silverman. She is uh, working very industriously on this tenant protection agenda, and she's going to be a member of the second panel uh, starting at 315, and she's going to be talking about yet more legislation, recently enacted laws. Uh, so you can tell that, you know, again, our theme, a lot has been done, a lot yet to do. And then uh, I'm also going to acknowledge um, Danielle Burrs, who was a, a, a legislative uh, counsel for Brianne Nando, and that's my segue to the last piece of legislation that got done in the last council session and actually became law earlier this year, and that is the, I call it lien authority, but it's more complicated. The title is actually the Relocation Expenses Recruitment and Lien Authority Amendment Act of 2016. And what this is about is, as most of you know, OTA has an emergency housing uh, program uh, where if tenants have been displaced by, mainly by government closures or fires, uh, the OTA will uh, provide uh, housing for them, generally hotel stays on an emergency basis for 14 to 28 days, pending their ability to return back to their rehabilitated homes or to find new, new housing. Uh, the problem is that um, quite often, not all the time, the displacement has been caused by the dereliction of the landlord. And in those cases, uh, the OTA and our policymakers, including Mayor Gray, uh, agreed that uh, the, it's not the taxpayers who should pick up that tab. It should be the derelict housing provider. So we requested lien authority. Uh, council member uh, Brianne Ando helped shepherd that through the council and it got made effect, it, it took effect earlier this year, but we needed the funding for it and that actually happened as well it, through the budget cycle this year. So uh, as of the start of the next fiscal year, we're going to be able to start uh, leaning the properties of landlords who cause the displacement of the tenants by not properly maintaining their buildings. So that's, that's a, along with the Tenant Bill of Rights, that's another big accomplishment in terms of our agency's interests. Um, and that having been said, um, we promised that we were going to leave half an hour 
for Q and A. Uh, we'll have a, a closing comment, so that leaves just a few minutes for the panelists to follow up in some way to make a comment about or ask a question of another panelist or any follow-up comment you want to make. Um, or we can go straight to audience Q and A. Okay. Okay. So I think we're going to have you please step up to the mic if you um, if you have a question. And in the interest of time and getting in all questions, please keep your questions very brief. Okay. Um, do you mind if I call you Rob? No, please do. Rob, my question is directly to you. You mentioned uh, about the Brightwood neighborhood. I'm up in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, I wasn't part of that, but I've been in my place 18 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been battling with my landlord. I'm a four unit building. And um, four unit buildings in the district are pretty much discriminated against, mm -hmm. you know, according to the right. universal policy. So I've been in this battle with my landlord, 18 years, they said, you're always doing something. And I said, you're always not doing something. <laughs> so I'm just one of these mild <laughs> tenants. It took me 13 years to get a roof from the league, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But they tried that with us. But I find you that. You tried, tried what? Do what? The voluntary. The, the voluntary. Oh, yeah. So well, they're using it now, but. I'm wondering, is there any protection policy being looked at for four-unit buildings, for tenants of four-unit buildings with the type of information you just put out for tenants in buildings of the, you know, to protect us? So I guess what as you're- As far as not using, as far as the landlords not using self-help. So I'm the only one that speaks up in the buildings. Mm -hmm. The other families, are Hispanic, Ethiopian, African. They're afraid of consequences. So I'm the tenant association by myself. So I'm wondering, how can I get the other families to come forward without being afraid to face the same landlord I'm facing? And the self-help that they're using now with, um, for instance, one of the other families, they needed a floor, the carpet pulled up, and they needed the floor replaced. So they made that family go buy the materials up at Walmart. And they told them they would have to pay for it to be replaced. But the rent was increased the following year. So what, is, what, what type of policy protection is being looked at for that? four-unit buildings? Um, well, I can respond to that. I mean, or Joel, do you have something? I mean, is any type of so I, protection uh, for the tenants so I, like it would be in larger buildings? So, so in, large in terms of conditions issues, like right. landlords refusing right. to do repairs, I, w I don't think the situation is any better in big buildings than in small buildings. The main issue with four-unit buildings that differentiates them from larger buildings, and as far as I know, is rent control. If, you're, if, if you own four, uh, four units or fewer as a landlord in D.C., you're not subject to rent control. Um, and so there are a lot of four-unit buildings. There are a lot of individual owners who own one four-unit building. Those are all units that rent can go up as much as possible. It can just go up as much as the market will bear. And that means that in neighborhoods that reach a certain tipping point, landlords can just do whatever increase they need to displace people uh, through that cost burden and then flip that flip that building. And that's four units of affordable housing that's lost really quickly. Um, in terms of code enforcement, and forcing landlords to actually pay for maintenance themselves, that is a problem everywhere in DC. In, in big buildings and small buildings and single family homes, it, low income people are just like getting very, very poor quality service from their landlords and landlords are generally not held accountable. And in my experience, I, like it is, it is unfortunately sort of up to the tenant completely to be doing the, to, to be putting pressure on a landlord either by going to court or withholding rent. I mean, I, I've done that. Mm -hmm. they, for the past three years, they haven't been able to raise my rent more than $3. Mm -hmm. So, but I fight them. Yeah. But I can't get, you know, that family, even under DCRA regulation, if we, if they wanted something done, like they used to do random buildings, and they would come out and look at the buildings. Fortunately, I was able to get DCRA to come and pick our building mm -hmm. to do the things and come in and then penalize the landlord. Yeah. 
but I mean, is so, there any policy protection coming up for people who are in these? Well, I can, I can speak to, so I assume your building is exempt from rent control because it's we for are, fewer you units. You are rent controlled if you know it, but if you don't know it, you don't know it. You know, you have to look at your, you know, your lease. Well, right, o owner is entitled to an exemption, but if uh, that exemption wasn't taken, then yeah. yes, you are subject to rent control. Right. In terms of the building conditions, problems with smaller mm -hmm. uh, buildings, smaller accommodations, um, I can't speak to the status of the program, but there was a, uh, as a result of the um, affordable housing uh, preservation strike force that was a mayoral appointed uh, board basically to look right. at questions right. about uh, both affordability and, qu and quality. Um, there was a, 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 an upshot, a new program that was developed uh, called something like the Small Housing Provider uh, Fund. Um, and the purpose is to uh, get financial assistance to housing providers who uh, you know, may have a smaller uh, revenue margin, profit margin, and need that assistance to help maintain the quality of the rental housing. Uh, I believe that program was rolled out, as I recall, sometime within the past year. Uh, but I, I do not know uh, currently about uh, the status well, of buildings curious. in the pipeline or the application process. Right. But if you, but I, I can look into that. So okay. if you, yeah. Um, yeah. But that was a good question. Beth might it, know something about this. Well, I was just going to say, it sounds like one thing you're talking about maybe, which is a real issue right now, um, you know, given kind of the climate across the country around immigration, I know a lot of folks who are immigrants uh, especially if they are undocumented, are very afraid. That's very real. I wish that was a problem we could solve. Um, but you know, if you're if a tenant complains, any tenant about something, and the landlord does something to punish them, so says, for example, to somebody who the landlord thinks or knows is undocumented, I'm going to call ICE. I'm going to get you deported. That is illegal under DC law. Um, that is what's called retaliation. Well, I know that's illegal, and I've told them that. I advocate a lot, and I've yeah. told them that, but they're still afraid to do yeah. it. Yeah, and I understand why. Um, you know, tenants in that situation have every right that every other tenant in D.C. has. Um, I wish we had an easy answer to the fear. The so fear there is, is real. no protection policy being looked at, right, for, for four units? Don't four units have the same protection in terms of, like, the landlord's going to make repairs. Right. Yes. yes. The same laws apply, but the question but whenever, is how. Whenever a landlord, the small, my building, says they're doing capital improvement, they're not capital improvement, but the rent still goes up. You have to have a capital improvement to prove to the administrator that this is a, a bona fide rent increase, right? So I think the, the one thing about rent increases, and I forget who mentioned it, somebody else mentioned this, um, those four unit buildings sometimes are exempt. That is something that maybe oh, at some okay. point the council will All look right. at. Because as you said, I, you know, everyone knows the district is full of four unit buildings. There is a lot of housing stock in those four unit buildings. And a lot of them aren't under rent control and aren't protected from those large rent okay. increases. Right. Thank you. Sure. Good question. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Venus, and I'm a resident counselor at the Tyler House Apartments. I have kind of like three questions. I'm a direct one. The first one is to Joe. Uh, second one is to Mr. Scott Rupert. And the third one, Miss Jennifer, if you don't get it. And, and they're all yes or no questions, right? So we can keep uh, it short. I'll just throw them out there, and you guys can, okay. if you have time, to answer. First one, Joe, um, my uh, landlord is uh, not respecting the District of Columbia tenant bill of rights, tenant's rights to organize. And I can tell you a piece that they are uh, not respecting, and that's the piece to uh, allow uh, tenant associations and outside tenant organizations mm -hmm. to come in and exercise or uh, distribute literature to the residents. Uh, they refuse their right to outside organizers. Uh, if you can uh, later right. on, maybe I can get with you. I just want to. Put well, it I'll, I'll just say very briefly that the the tenant bill of rights itself, that requirement that the housing provider provide a copy of the tenant bill of rights uh, to every rental applicant and then to every tenant upon request. I don't think that's what you're talking about, but just so everybody knows, that's a disclosure requirement, just like the dozen, couple dozen other disclosures that have to be made. Mm -hmm. And if that's violated, they refuse to provide the tenant bill of rights, that's subject 
to uh, a penalty of no rent increase, at least until they come into compliance. Um, but in terms of the problem that you're identifying about, it sounds to me like the Tenant Right to Organize Act. So the, there's been a, a law in the books since 2006 that tenants have the right to organize in the District of Columbia. And that means that the landlord can't prevent tenants from meeting, meeting privately outside the earshot of the housing provider. They have a right to, to distribute leaflets. Uh, they have a right to let in outside uh, advocates to help educate them about um, their rights and their remedies. And if there's any interference with that, there are remedies for that under the law as well. So, so I'd suggest that you come into, the, does that make sense? You look puzzled. It, it does, but they have some misconception of understanding that literature piece. Well, or, uh, or, or not. We can't, like <laughs> or, they, or they just don't want to. I can't knock on right. residents' doors to uh, talk to them. Okay. They try to stand downstairs and distribute literature. I would suggest, let's talk afterwards, but I think okay. also it sounds like a, an issue that you're going to want to come into to our office and talk to, talk to us about so we can help. Yeah. I would say, I, you know, I think you should just do what you have the right to do and let them break the law. You're trying, you're trying to get you right, you're locked up. <laughs> I, uh, Ms. Brin, I have another, uh, my question to you is the TOPA rights. Um, um, my church owned a building, a uh, little three-story uh, building, three-unit building, and it was just one resident living in the building. Us as the landlords gave the resident 30 days and asked ready to move out, like last year, year before, two years ago. The resident had not moved out. Do we owe it to him? Uh, his TOPA rights to purchase the building before or asking him to move or? There's, there's a two-part answer question to that one. Um, first would be, under what reasons did you give him 30 days notice? Uh, building code, you know, violations, just code. You mean, code. you mean you as the landlord had violated the code and so you asked him to leave? Well, I'll... The building is not up to code violations. So that's not justification for asking the tenant to leave? Okay. Um, it's incumbent upon the landlord to fix the code violations. Um, if, the, if this tenant, the tenant can only, you can only ask a tenant to move. I don't, I mean, unless there are other issues, I don't think you have any grounds upon which to ask the tenant to move. Um, and since the tenant still resides there, um, and you haven't pursued eviction, then, um, and are you interested, is the church interested in selling the property or, or, or uh, demolishing selling, it? So I missed that part. The interest in selling the property, so that's why I should have said, do we owe him this token? Yes, you absolutely do. And if I was advising the tenant, I would um, tell him to file, no offense, but I would tell him to, to find a lawyer to help him uh, because his, landl his, his landlord is, is <laughs> giving him since I'm not a lawyer, I can't say whether it's not, but right. maybe giving him what are not legal um, uh, requests to move and that he should defend his rights of tenancy and demand TOPA rights if the uh, landlord is attempting and to sell the building. Thank, thank you, Scott. And Venus, we, I was just given the 10-minute signal, so we're going to move on, but let's talk uh, afterwards. Um, let me just say, we have one of our honorees from this morning at the mic, so Ken Rothschild. Thank you. Okay, I just want to raise three things. It doesn't require a tremendous amount of uh, your response, although I would be interested. Uh, <clears throat> one thing, I think you mentioned treble damages. Treble damages was in the law back a ways. Uh, when I had a problem, I didn't know it, but I started a petition and then I realized treble damages, and believe me, it does make a big difference. For bad faith, and, and now it, it's extended for these other actions of the landlord that are prohibited by the legislation. Right, so is it in the law now? It, it was, it, so it always has been in the law for various violations, but these violations additionally are covered under treble damages. So it's clarifying that. Okay, good. The other, um, the other issue is I don't think 
tenant should be making a big profit off of these TOPA laws. Uh, it's outrageous that so many people have worked so hard to maintain, uh, Rob, you brought this issue up, I believe, um, have worked so hard to keep you know, some affordable housing in the city and, and have a windfall profit go to, to a tenant just because they happen to be in a building that some landlord wants to, to convert or sell to a converter. Um, I think something, that, that, that has lost us a lot of um, affordable units, a tremendous amount. Wait, the tenant using the loophole? No, the tenant? no, the TOPA, where the landlord goes in or the, the future developer goes in and says, I'm offering you 5,000. They say, no, we'll take 10,000. And they get 10,000 and they sign away their TOPA mm -hmm. uh, rights and, and they make a windfall profit essentially because the, the, somebody wants that building to convert and that has lost us a lot of units. Mm -hmm. So I think that really seriously has to be looked at. And then one other thing, this is kind of a, I don't know, it's an out there issue, but I'm going to raise it anyway. I mean, DC is, look at DC as a community, a whole community. Um, it's been divided into two sections. The new people coming in that got more money and the people that are just holding on to try and live their life out here and maintain their life. And I think there should be some looking at some type of a, 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 a share the prosperity kind of tax where, where the people who are coming in making this tremendous amount of profits can, can share with the rest of the community essentially a tax. I mean, look at what the stuff that they throw on the phone bill. You know, they got everybody in their, their brother getting a piece of the action in your phone bill. So I think something should be looked at in terms of these new developments, not just a, a $30 tax on a rental unit, but some type of a share the prosperity tax where, where the people who have come into the city now and developed this whole thing, and for one reason or another, they're free from rent control. I don't know whether that's gonna stick forever. But the point is, if they've got this sort of freedom from rent control, let them put back some portion into maintaining those people who have lived here a long time, paid the taxes, supported the city, and, and, and really allowed it to develop. So I'm, I'm, when I'm in, in, to make it concise, it's a share the prosperity tax. Can I point something out? Yeah. <clears throat> What you said before this, it relates. Sharing the prosperity for the people under rent control is sharing when TOPA comes up that there's this person who is going to profit from purchasing the building or going to profit from selling the building who's sharing with the tenants some of those benefits because the tenants are really the ones who have contributed also to this building for many years often by paying their rent by pointing out the repair issues, like many managers of the property. So just something to think about, but to relate But I'm, I'm talking about a sharing the prosperity that will maintain affordable housing. Okay. Not, that's the difference. In other words, I'm not against a tenant making a little profit and getting moving expenses and being compensated. Don't get me wrong. But there should be a share the prosperity across the board throughout the whole city. So, Ken, thank you very much. And I'm going to, I think there's going to be further feedback to those comments. But let's take the last. Um, you, so, the, these are the last two comments or questions. Please keep it brief, and then we'll have everybody respond to their, their, their choice of comments. How's that? Right. So, we can get everybody in. I got a question for Jennifer. Uh, my, building, my current building manager, she thinks that she can take and give my information because I'm a ticket to work program. But I believe that there is a thing called the ADA that uh, she's not supposed to be telling my affairs to other tenants. And this would seem that, that it's not only happened to me, but it's every time that something goes on, she feels that she can just take and tell my information out to every tenant in, that's in the building. I'm happy to talk with you further after about your rights in that situation. I think there may be a possibility that legislation could address this even more thoroughly. So it's an interesting idea you're raising. but. There are rights that I want to talk with you about after. Thanks. 
I make this question very quick. My building is currently engaged in a very um, well-known TOPA lawsuit. And how do we get the current owner to maintain the property and make the necessary repairs to make it habitable while this other lingering, lingering court case is going on? I'm from the Rittenhouse on 16th Street. The Rittenhouse on 16th Street oh. and Fort Stevens? Oh, yeah. How do we get them to fix the damn building? Because it's falling apart. <laughs> And we're going to get the approval to sell, but how do we get them to get it done? Just, just to be clear, the written house is in the middle of a TOPA action, is that right? And the tenants have are exercising their right? Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to tell you some things that you can do, and I'm not going to pretend like they, they always work because they don't. Um, I think Rob said earlier the problem of landlords not making repairs is a problem across the city. You can call out DCRA to do an inspection. Um, there's a process by which if you get signatures from some tenants, they will actually do a building-wide inspection and put notices up and look at all the different units. So you might want to call and ask about that. Um, there is a, a part of the Superior Court that's called the Housing Conditions Calendar. So if you just Google that, you can pull up something on the court's website. And that allows tenants to come into court and file a lawsuit just to get repairs. So it's not about money. Um, it doesn't matter if you owe rent. Um, it's not a way for you to get money, unfortunately, back if you've paid rent when you shouldn't have. But um, you can file. It's a very kind of straightforward, just check the box form. And you file it in the court. You get a hearing. And um, a DCRA inspector who is, in my opinion, one of the best inspectors who works for the city is tied to that court. She will go out. She will inspect. She will make a list of things that need to be done. And the judge will keep having you come back. It's a long process. It can be frustrating. But you will keep coming back um, and checking in about what has been done and what hasn't been done. And if the process drags on, you can ask that judge to punish the landlord by ordering that you don't have to pay your rent if they are still not making repairs. Um, the other thing you can do if you're in a rent control building, although it's a really long process, is you can file a tenant petition. And that allows you to have a judge say, your rent should go down for some period of time until repairs are made. But also for a three year period from when you file it going back, if you've lived at the building that long, you can ask the judge to order uh, some of your rent back to you. So th those are some of the things you can do. I'd be happy to give you a card and you know, speak with you. And Rob, Rob or Scott? Okay. No, no. I mean, well, Scott, do you want to start with this? Um, I was just going to ask a quick question. Uh, the Rittenhouse Topa is about getting on three years old. Um, and I know you had a very odd situation with litigation between uh, when the Tenants Association switched which developer it wanted to go with. And also, your Topa attorney has left town and relocated. I was wondering, is the who is the association being represented by? Festerheim. What? Uh, David Festerheim. Oh, okay. And um, <laughs> and then also, are you still in touch with Housing Counseling Services? Mm. Okay, because they or LEDC uh, are the best people to work with as far as conditions issues, and Housing Counseling Services would would know. Um, the, the history, but I think Rob probably knows some of the history of what's going on. You're, you're in a very unique situation because the litigation is being fueled by the contending developers. So, and I was going to ask Rob, Rob the, the, the question there uh, might be, Top, TOPA is supposed to empower mm -hmm. tenants at the time well, of a ch changeover of ownership. And how would you say that you, you ties into You frequently see, well, so, yeah, so if the tenants usually are choosing a developer who's going to make a guarantee to do certain repairs, to do upgrades on the building. That's the thing that tenants look for when they're assigning their rights. Now, a lot of developers just lie and promise things they're not going to do, especially if they're trying to, like, add value to the building by raising rents. They obviously have an interest in pushing out all of the longtime tenants immediately, so they'll do a lot of bad construction. They'll neglect the tenants who've been in the property for a long time. They'll try to put pressure on people to leave. And there's often, unfortunately, a long post-TOPA battle that happens if tenants assign their rights to, to some developer who's trying to like, you know, increase the revenue they're dragging out of that building. The, TOPA is supposed to guarantee better conditions. It, there, are, there can be problems with that, that that are related to the use of voluntary agreements to sort of to up to move properties up the uh, up to sort of more 
costly parts of the market. But I wanted to respond to the question about like what to do when you're in that TOPA process, because it is a real problem. TOPA takes a long time. Landlords frequently just stop doing basic maintenance. Um, f landlords frequently stop doing basic maintenance for a million reasons all over town. So there are buildings that are in the process of being sold where the landlords don't do anything. There are just properties where poor people without a so lot of social power to like get repairs live, and landlords neglect them because they can get away with it. Uh, there are places where landlords are trying to just drive the tenants out so that they can sell an empty building. Um, it is, I mean, the, the thing that we have not talked about on this panel very much is, I think, the most significant problem in rental housing in DC, which is the failure to enforce conditions. That is just something that the, the public authorities generally fail to do. Um, the, there are court systems set up. The housing conditions calendar is useful to get certain repairs done, but they don't fix structural building issues. They will, like, say, paint that wall, and if when there's, like, a continuing leak behind that wall that leads to mold reappearing on a consistent basis, they can only really affect cosmetic issues, and that's a huge problem with housing conditions court. Um, so there are, there are things that, there are legal processes that tenants can go through. I have not seen those to be terribly effective, and I'll be honest, and most lawyers will not agree with the advice I'm about to give, so you know, take this with a grain of salt. I find that the best course of action for tenants is not to pay for what you don't get. Uh, there are mechanisms where landlord, where tenants can withhold their rent from landlords. Uh, you can. So, so now we have to save time for rebuttal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But I would say, like, rent strikes work. Like, DCRA doesn't usually work. Housing conditions calendar sometimes works. Rent strikes work. Right. So, so, Rob, so Scott has 30 seconds, and then Beth and Jennifer are going to jump on Rob. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just real quick, I think uh, the, my question is, do you know if the sale of the building has closed or if the building is still in the ownership of the original seller and the two contending developers are still vying for the purchase? The building has not been sold. It is still owned by the original owner. And the loss is not about TOPA. It's about the contract breach by the third party who it, claims it, to want to pay. Exactly. And that. that's why yours is a very specific problem. That, that the, the, the owner, your owner was in financial distress. And that's why they decided to sell. And the Tenants Association, because of conflicting opinions, uh, chose one developer and then decided to back out and choose a different developer. And that's where the breach of contract issue came up. And now the two contending developers are effectively funding this, the lawsuit. And the financially, dis and the financially distressed owner is neglecting the property because they feel, my guess is because they feel trapped. And so what since this is this is really not a topa issue as far as the the stuff is or that stuff and so the best way to go would be um to to, to file a housing provider petition or to try to get dcra to do uh, a whole building inspection because your focus is not on the contending developers your focus is on getting the con continuing owner to maintain the building during the process. Yeah, Jennifer's going to say. So Jennifer's going to make a very brief point, Please and then we have to wrap it up. Please don't withhold your rent, and here's why. Oh. You will, if you are a voucher holder, for instance, that could impair your voucher. If you are wanting to get the heck out of that unit at some point, it's going to impair your credit, potentially. Here's another option. There's housing conditions calendar. Um, there's also suing in Superior Court Civil Division separately from housing conditions calendar. We sometimes team up with pro bono law firms who can bring in those experts who can press the landlord to make the repairs through court order. And then lastly, receivership. There is a possibility under the receivership statute that a receiver could receive the rents. And they can use those rent, that rent to make the repairs. But why should you look bad? Why should you get a lawsuit against you? when you're not the one who did right. anything wrong. That's, that's my argument. The, the, and the, that, for the reasons Jennifer stated, that is always the OTA's advice, is don't withhold rent. If you choose to, despite legal advice, at least escrow the amount of rent that you're not paying, put it into the bank, a dedicated account, so you can prove to, make payment and prove to the judge that you're withholding rent in good faith. Uh, so with that, 
Uh, I guess we're wrapping up this session. The break is now reduced to seven minutes, but please complete your surveys. There's a lot, by, I just, one last comment I have to make. There's a lot of folks in this room uh, who really helped found the OTA and has helped us every step of the way. I wish I could acknowledge you all, but thank you very much. Thank you.